On this episode of Riff and Rock Music Talk, Ryan and I explore the commonalities between Thinkfish and Trot Mask Replica. What would they have in common? Find out by listening to Riff and Rock Music Talk. Don't know who Luke Pearlman is. No. He basically, um, he was the cr- more I, creator would be the right word. Creator, manager, exploiter of Backstreet Boys, In Sync, LFO, O Town, like all, almost every big boy ba- boy band from the '90s. He was in charge of, and he formed to put together. He is currently serving 25 years in prison for a Ponzi scheme. Oh boy! But he's just fat creepy goon that just there was just a lot of specific events of how he was stealing money from the band members um like for one he had signed himself as the sixth member of the backstreet boys and was being paid accordingly no on top of like all the licensing and production and managing fees so he was making millions of bucks off these people plus he was in the band technically i want to be like that guy (laughs) just take advantage of Young twenty-year-old, good-looking men. You know it. It sounds a lot worse when you say it out loud. I love taking advantage of barely legal men. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Riff and Rock Music Talk is back. Uh, we have nothing better to do on a Saturday night. You know, while people are out partying and having a good time, we are sitting on our computers talking about things. And looking at things. We are looking at things. I am looking and sitting and talking and hearing and talking. And I am sitting and talking and looking as well as talking. Huh. Interesting. I want to give a shout out to all 13 people that like us. What up, y'all? Tell your friends to listen to us talk and sit. And you can sit and listen to us, too. Or you can be moving and listen to us because you can either stream our podcasts or download them. So perhaps on your long commute in, you want to listen to two people gab about things that are mildly relevant to your interests. And if you're really lucky and you pull, play your cards right, you can be a guest on our show. We have no qualms with that. Warning. Completely irrelevant material about to happen. Please fast forward to actually get to the music talk. No qualms whatsoever. Write us a, requ- just write us a request at I think my opinion is more justified. Dot net. GeoCities. <laughs> People still use AOL, by the way. Um, you can search us on Alta Vista. <laughs> yeah, and, and, Ask and, Jeeves. Well, yeah, and you can use AOL, a keyword riff and rock. But you don't don't use Bing. Please don't use Bing. Do you think AOL um, keywords do still work? Do those still work? They do, believe it or not. <laughs> they only work through uh, Internet Explorer, and then you have to put AOL colon space whatever. Wow, that's amazing. Internet Explorer still supports that. I think it was the only one that supported AOL keywords. Well, there wasn't what like Netscape Navigator. What else was there back in the nineties? Oh yeah, Netscape. <laughs> Hang on, I want to download. <laughs> I want to see what's up with Netscape. Don't download Netscape. <laughs> Netscape is still around, everybody. <laughs> All right, so look us up on Riff and Rock Music Talk on Netscape. And remember, to, AOL keyword. remember to properly misspell it as we did. There we are. We're right there <laughs> through Netscape. <laughs> Are you using Netscape now? I am. <laughs> Man, that is so amazing. We are right under a 9 gag a link, which is under the 100 riffs of A Brief History of Rock and Roll. Huh. It's pretty cool. I think it uh, it's fitting. I think it is fitting. I think it's fitting that we're doing this podcast uh, on the day that hockey has started again. Hooray, hockey! You can return to watching people punch each other on ice skates. And you can stop watching grown men hug each other like it with football. We have seasons are almost over. They are. Yeah. The hugging will soon come to an end. And so will the fake girlfriends. Did you hear about that? Yeah, that was that was weird. That was bizarre. It's not like it it was like somebody that uh like sits around and plays 
MMOs all day. They're the ones that usually would go. You. Yeah, they're the ones that usually go. I have a girlfriend, and um, this time it was a uh, someone who's gonna go pro, just to fake his girlfriend. Very bizarre. Yeah, that was weird. Yeah, you know who else is weird? Who? Frank Zappa is weird. God damn it, Frank Zappa! What the hell's wrong with you? <sighs> Frank Zappa is super weird. We decided today's episode is gonna be a "What the hell is your problem?" episode, where we're gonna call out some artists, living or not. And say, what the hell is wrong with you? Even though we love them. But what the hell? What the hell? What the hell? I figure we... I, I, I didn't really know how we wanted to start this. Well, um... Uh, I think you should, uh... List or... Uh, bring up a few examples of... Where Frank Zappa really went off the rails. Frank, well... In, go ahead. No, I've got a few uh, examples as well, but I feel like you've got the most glaring of all examples. Yeah, well, let me preface by saying that Frank Zappa, in general, is... He's probably in my top five artists. Like, top five artists or bands, Zappa would be in the top five. The other four... So, yeah? would you describe him as one of your fartists? <laughs> fartists. <laughs> I was trying to have a straight face, just staring at my screen, and I, was, and I kept going, just don't laugh, don't laugh. Didn't work. Yeah. yeah. Two, fartist, that's good. Yeah, he's definitely a fartist of mine. Um, I think he is a brilliant composer and songwriter. If you listen to his live material, you can just see the amount of dedication he puts into forming solid live performances. I would make a recommendation. If you are curious, look out for Hammersmith Odeon. It's a concert from 1978 or 79. Features a, one of my favorite lineups, including uh, Terry Bozio on drums, Adrian Ballou on guitar. Um, and actually, the concert is uh, one of four concert series they did in London, which those recordings, after serious amounts of overdubs, would turn into uh, his magnum opus, Cheek Your Booty. So I just want to lay it out there that I'm giving this guy guff because I love Frank Zappa. In the same way that... I will give endless shit to the Mars Volta or Magma because I love the Mars Volta and I love Magma. Because I love them, I want them to be get to get better. I want them to improve themselves. And then I can laugh at them too. But <laughs> Ryan knows what I'm talking about here. Not leather this way you'd think you'd spell leather, but leather, L, A with some umlauts over it, T-H-E-R. It is a obnoxiously long album. It would have been a quad LP. Frank Zappa pitched it to Warner Brothers, and they looked at him and went, you're out of your mind. Uh, no one's going to buy this. This is a small novel worth of vinyl. It's going to cost a lot of money. So they split it into four albums, still cut out some material, and it was a whole legal mess. He actually aired the album on the radio, asking people to record it while he was broadcasting to make bootleg copies. Um, a couple years after he died, they actually did the, the proper release of Leather, and I really respect when an artist does a big body of work. Um, so long as it's not the, the song titled The Six Hour Song, not that we haven't beat up on the Flaming Lips enough, but, you know, I don't have a personal objection to that. This is very long. It is very bloated. As much as there are good songs, it's also just filled with just shit. That's what she said. Yeah. It, Long, bloated, and filled with shit. Yes. It gets a little overwhelming. Some of the songs are just live takes. So a lot of it's on studio. And then, well, and Zappa did this a lot, where, you know, he would splice live and uh, studio on top of each other, which is fine. But then there's audience noise, and it just comes off as not really cohesive. And it seemed like Frank just went, if I put all these songs together, it'd be a great idea. And it doesn't really come off that well. <laughs> it's it's interesting. It's worth a listen. But I think it took me like three days to get through it all. Because I'd have to stop, put it down, go go somewhere. Stop, put it down, stop, put it down. And by the end of it, I'm like, it felt exhausting. 
Uh, you hear, you heard it here first, folks. Frank Zappa is exhausting. He is exhausting. Some of his albums are very exhausting, but very rewarding, such as Hammersmith Odeon, because it's a three CD album. It is very long, but it's very rewarding. Other ones like um, Uncle Meat have brilliant moments, and then you get to the thirty minute film excerpt. And that doesn't have any reward to it. You just listen to 37 minutes of people reading script. Yeah. You've heard, you've listened to Uncle Me too, haven't you? I have. And uh, did you actually it's sit, like a... did you actually sit through the entire 30 minutes of film excerpt? Yeah, it was, it was so weird. Like what the, what the hell Frank Zappa? <laughs> Nobody wants to listen to 30 minutes of a film. <laughs> One half of a film experience is watching it. In fact, that's that should be three quarters of the entire film. Holy crap! Nobody, what? <laughs> Let alone a film made by Frank Zappa, and, or a film that he did the score for, no, it, which is really easy. It, I've written numerous scores for movies. <laughs> it's real. It's real simple. For suspenseful scenes, you get the brass. For heartfelt scenes, you get the the strings. For every other scene, like when the goblins show up or um, right before the family eats the green stuff, like in uh, Troll 2, all you need is a synthesizer. That's all you need. And they're going to eat me. My name is Ryan. I do film scores. Holla. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's 37 minutes of film. It, you know, it made me think of. What if on the soundtrack to Jurassic Park there was 37 minutes of just the Jurassic Park film on there? Yep. That would be cool. <laughs> it's actually just all the dinosaur roars harmonized. Clever girl. Clever girl. <laughs> no, that's Star Wars. I can't remember. Uh, 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 uh. You didn't say the magic word. Please, motherfucker! Please! <laughs> Samuel Jackson. I fucking love that scene. Uncle Meat, I don't think ever got finished, but there was one Zappa film that got finished, and that was uh, Baby Snakes, which is just about three hours long. I've seen it once, and once was enough. And again, I had to. I would watch thirty minutes, put it down, and I'd have to leave. I go, no, 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 I can't watch any more of this for today. It's fucking exhausting. I have to go socialize myself real quick. I have to go write in my Zango or my live journal about what I just witnessed. God. Uh, I miss live journal so much. I'm sorry, I just had a nostalgic moment. You have to write about your feelings and hope people read it and leave comments. And do stupid surveys. Yeah. But yeah it's three hours long, and it's a mix of concert footage and behind-the-scenes footage, which on their own are okay, but then they add, like, I think at least 45 minutes worth of claymation that has nothing to do with anything. It's just 45 minutes of claymation and goofy Frank Zappa music on the, in the background. <laughs> it made no sense. No, it sounds like a Frank Zappa album. It, basically, it's like a Frank Zappa album as a film. And the thing is that it's not like one section, then another section, then another section. It's all the scenes are just kind of cut and spliced into each other. So it's they're in the middle of a song and then, oh, there's some claymation. And oh, now they're playing with a blow up doll in the sink. Uh... Which happens. Napoleon Murphy Brock has a blow up doll for the majority of the film. He was later arrested for pedophilia. Huh. And then he tries to put a gas mask on the blow up doll. It's just a whole thing. Ooh. Frank Zappa hangs out with some weird people. He hangs out with some really fucking weird people. Some amazing people, but some really fucking weird people. Like, uh, who was the really weird person he hung out with? Um, I'm sure he hung out with Oprah's husband at one point in time. I'm sure they hung out a couple times. Maybe. <laughs> weird people, you know. Well, he also invented weird people, too, in his little stories. Now, there's one story, and this is what I've been building up to, and you know where this is going. I do. The 1984, I can't say classic or disaster, because it's neither, because for it to be a classic or disaster, it has to be observed by people. Um, (laughs) uh, Motherfucking Thingfish. Thingfish. Let me tell you. No, Ryan, you tell them about Thingfish. Um, so, I briefly listened to Thingfish once, um... It started off with some guy, Terry Bozio. I think he's a drummer, maybe. 
Um, and he just starts talking about some sort of white people, I guess. But he does in a really awful, uh, poorly grammatized manner. Um, and he's like trying to tell a story, but it doesn't make any sense because the words that he's saying aren't like real words for the most part. They're basically it's sort of like parodies of like how white people made fun of black people, and so that's how the black people talk in the fil- in the soundtrack or score. Yeah, and so there's the dibba dabba da hooba da wa da ba It's like Jar Jar Binks they language. Sound, they sound exactly like Jar Jar Binks. L- a little bit lower range, but yeah, they sound like Gungans. And they sound like his aunt Jar Jar Mima Binks. I apologize when you once I realized we got to Thing Fish, I went. I need a scotch to get through Thing Fish. <laughs> if you guys do not have a scotch in your hand because of reasons like you don't drink or anything, don't grab a scotch. Grab a Capri Sun. But if you have no qualms about consuming alcohol, now is the time to pour yourself a nice quarter of a glass of some. Glen Livet. I have Glen Fittick. Ooh, he's got he's got the cheap stuff. Oh yay. Yeah. So we will we will wait patiently while you guys pour yourselves a glass of shit. The album is a weird combination of sort of skip pieces, because this is technically the the score for a play that was never produced or whatever. And hopefully it will never ever be produced. Well, they actually did, my understanding is some people did a very small scale production of it. Really? Yeah, but naturally no one heard, and I think no <laughs> one went. Like, I, Good. I, I love Frank Zappa, and I will apologize for some of his shenanigans, but even though he's trying to be ironic with his humor and whatever, it, it's not even the potential offensiveness, it's just the stupidity of it. The uh, the scene with the uh, the sex scene with the uh, suitcase yeah, think, or the briefcase. I think you could best describe the briefcase sex scene. Well, when I was listening to Thing Fish, I was also playing a video game, so <laughs> I kind of half paid attention to it, and it was freaking me the hell out. Um, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this lady starts having sex with a briefcase. Because if I recall, it's her her husband's having sex with a black woman. So she got. Freaky with the briefcase. Yeah, particularly the handle, I guess. Yes. Which doesn't sound neither hygienic nor comfortable. And the narrator asked her to keep the briefcase closed. Maybe like as a joke as to keep it clothed? I don't know. I listened to this today, kind of going into this. I went, you know what? If we're going to talk Zappa, I need to be able to talk about Thingfish. And um, I don't know what the fuck happened. Here, actually, some actually some good songs would come up, but then you listen to them and you go, "Oh, wait a minute, these are reworks from other albums." Oh, that's right. Like you are what you is. The instead of the torture never stops, it's now the torture never stops. Does that version have beef heart in it? Um, it didn't have beef heart originally either. One of the versions had beef heart in it. Of torture never stops. Yeah, I mean maybe a live this... version. But that... I think it was. Yeah. Because the original didn't. Beef Art was on Bongo Fury, which is actually a super weird but awesome album. Um, we'll get to that in a second. And then he was on... He's like on a couple random songs here and there. Like He he was on Willie the Pimp from Hot Rats. He had like four lines. Yay. But it still was great. I want to recommend this like on a novelty basis. Like You should listen to Thingfish just to be confused. But... It's long. It's an hour and a half. Oh, god damn it. <laughs> it is, it's a long hour and a half of some guy going, the mammy would none to the hippie da boopa to live by. And I don't mean it like that to be offensive or anything. It's just that's like, without that's any. That's what it sounds like. It sounds like. It's, em- it's embarrassing. It's so weird. Part of me wants to re listen to it to give it a chance, but at the same time, like, why am I gonna sit down and listen to another another ninety minutes of thing fish? Yeah, uh, re-listening to it, I'm never going to. No. but you, the listeners, definitely should give it about twenty minutes of your give time. It, give it. If you, if you have twenty minutes, I think you'll finish. You'll get to a couple skip pieces and maybe one or two songs, and then never listen to it again. And well, if for some reason it really tickles your fancy, I guess keep going if you really want to. <laughs> 
No one's going to stop you. No one is going to stop you from listening to Think Fish. There's no Think Fish police. Um, we, God we just showed you the door. Yeah. You have to walk through it yourself. Oh, <laughs> uh, jeez. This is... This <laughs> fucking Think Fish. Are there any other weird things that you uh, think Frank Zappa really messed up on? Because I can think of one. Messed up on... Let me see what I have, what I've listened to. There's a couple other albums that are like just kind of questionable. Um, I wouldn't say bad. There's one other one I'm looking at that's, again, I have a hard time saying it's bad. It's just kind of goofy, um, which I'll meant, uh, which is Lumpy Gravy. I don't know if that's what you were thinking. It wasn't. I wasn't really thinking of his music. I was just thinking of his life. Oh, his life? Some weird, stupid, awful life decisions he made. <laughs> Album-wise, um, I think, I w- I, to be honest, it's all really weird. It's all kind of like you got to listen to it a couple times because he just doesn't follow the rules. He's a rebel like that. Uh, it does provide for, if you're willing to invest, there's a good payoff sometimes. Like, Sheik Your Booty is one of my favorite albums ever. Um, I agree. It's a fantastic album. Fantastic album. album, Horrendously offensive lyrics at some point. But the music (laughs) is so good that you just kind of forgive that there's songs like I Have Been In You and Broken Hearts Are For Assholes and Jewish Princess. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, nothing. (laughs) Um, My favorite song from that album is City of Tiny Lights. uh, City of Tiny Lights. It's got Adrian Ballou singing. And tiny cookies. Tiny cookies. Tiny pillows. I like Dancing Fool. That's a classic. It's a it's a great hit at parties. It is. I proved that. At strip clubs. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what else I'd add to that. Even some of his orchestral work is good, like the Yellow Shark, um, which is a or it's a like symphony music done by Zappa. Um, I don't know. There's a great oh one other thing I'll add before Ryan, the floor is yours on your comment. There's a album called Playground Psychotics, which is just a mixture of just mostly nonsense. It's again just kind of a stupid album. However, in 1971, he was he was doing an interview, and he was approached by, uh, well, the interviewer said, "Hey, I got some people that really want to meet you." For example, said, "Okay," and it turned out to be John Lennon and Oko Yono, o- or Oko Yoko Yoko Ono, o- Oko y- Yoko Ono, and um. So Frank invited them on stage to perform with them a couple songs. And on Playground Psychotics, they have their recordings of that. And it's relatively interesting on multiple levels. Um, There is also video footage. They put Yoko Ono in a burlap sack and try to push her away from the microphone for a bit. But it's a good good recording. (laughs) That was a wise move. That was a wise move. Sorry, Yoko. (laughs) Oh, dear. Dear, oh, dear. All right, so... What what about Frank Zappa has made you go, what the hell? Oh, hi, Mark. Oh, hi, Mark. Well, first of all, I'm not sure if you listeners know, but this motherfucker ran for president. Did he really? I forget the year. Yeah, he ran for president of the Libertarian Party. I believe it. What the fuck? <laughs> Who would vote for him? Libertarians? Yeah, obviously, they, all 12 of them. They generally don't have anyone good to vote for anyway, so, you know, they have to take what they get. <laughs> Remember Babar? Or sorry, Babar, Babar. The, the Elephant King? Was he a libertarian? Yeah, Babar. I didn't know that. No, uh, in 2008, there's a guy that ran for president named Bob Barr. Oh. But, of course, when you say it, it sounds like Babar, you know, the, the Elephant King. The Elephant King. Uh, I'm waiting for 2016 for this inanimate carbon rod. Oh yes, I'm I'm excited to cast my vote. <laughs> All right, so was that your Zappa running for president? There is another thing, and it's easily f- forgotten. But I don't know why we let him get away with this. But oh, I think I know where the, you're going. Why the hell did he name his children Dweezil and Moon Unit? Um, and Amit. Amit was another one, and then there's a fourth one that everyone forgets. Uh, Tinky Winky. Yeah, Tinky Winky. Yeah, her, her name is Tinky Winky Rumplebottom. <laughs> Zappa. Zappa. <laughs> what the hell, Frank Zappa? Because you can get away with <laughs> it. 
And he didn't think like, people harassed kids on the playground. I'll leave you, I don't know, moon unit. Yeah. I don't think he was from Jersey at all. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> hey, moon unit. You got to come here for me. But I got to tell you something. I wrote a new song. What are you, deaf? It's a beautiful song. Why'd you cry? Why you hate big fish? <laughs> uh, all right, who's next? Who else are we going to riff on? The thing I was going to say about Zappo, which is where I thought you were going, is he was like a, an elected position in um, the Czech Republic for a while, for like a week. No, he wasn't. Yeah, he was. Uh, you heard it here first, everybody. Frank Zappa did get elected to a political position. He was uh, – I can't remember what it was. Well, it was an appointed position. I don't know if it was like an elected position. And um, he was – I can't remember the exact – what exactly what it was. President. Well, he, he had some weird appointed position, which was like bringing business to the Czech Republic. It was something like that. And um, he was appointed it, and the U.S. government went, we're going to blockade you if you don't stop this right now. And the Czech Republic agreed to stop. Well, that was weird. <laughs> it was a very short-lived and very bizarre uh, point in Frank Zappa's life. But I was going to bring up, as we transition into our next individual... Um, I want to talk about Bongo Fury for another couple minutes, or just for another quick minute, which is the Frank Zappa Captain Beefheart album, where Captain Beefheart inevitably screwed himself in the mid '70s by signing so many contracts. My understanding is he couldn't record or perform under his name because he had like locked himself in from like so many different directions. So he toured with Frank Zappa in the early mid '70s, and they produced an album called Bongo Fury, which is Frank Zappa music. So, you know, not conventional music. On top of Captain Beefheart vocals, um, it is a Just record. Play, it, I'm sorry. Sorry. What? It's really bizarre. So, yeah, that's Bongo Fury. It's very worth checking out. Very solid performances. Um, good lineup. It's an interesting mixture of two performers. Coincidentally, by the end of the tour, Captain, uh, not Captain Beefheart, Frank Zappa more or less refused to speak to Captain Beefheart until he was about to die. Because <laughs> allegedly, mm. instead of performing, Captain Beefheart would just sit on stage and draw pictures of Frank Zappa, and this naturally pissed off Frank Zappa very much. God, it's like it's like a child, kind of an overgrown, deep-voiced child that talks about having sex with bats or whatever it is that he talks about. I don't know what he talks about, but let's talk about Captain Beefheart for a little bit. <laughs> well, what's his what's his birth name? Don Villette. Don Von Vitz. Don Van Viet. Don Velveeta. <laughs> Don, well, he was born Don Glenn Vliet, but then he changed his name to Don Van Vliet. Well, you heard it here first. Captain Bifar is weird. <laughs> so weird that he changed his name in a very insignificant way. I think that's an understatement that he's weird. He did own a trout mask replica. That was... We, we know that. Yeah, his... Sort of his magnum opus, which is one way of putting it, was Captain Beefheart's trout mask replica. Have you ever listened to it? I have. What did you think of it? I, uh... <laughs> there's only one word that could properly describe that album. And cover your ears, young people and old people and people that don't like swear words. But Trout Mask Replica was a clusterfuck of sound. It's a cacophony yeah. of the worst imaginable, audible nuances smooshed together and toasted lightly in a charcoal-based panini that is that album. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, it's... You can't not talk about Captain Beefheart without talking about Trout Mask Replica. It's twenty. Yeah. It's twenty eight tracks long. <laughs> <laughs> That's a. <laughs> the musicians while recording this album, uh, they went on record saying they had no idea what the hell they were doing. Well, my understanding is I don't remember how long it was, but basically the performers 
I mean, in Beefheart, they base they were more or less locked in a cabin for months, practicing it. <laughs> and um, <laughs> they practiced. Well, yeah. <laughs> Oh shit! They practiced everybody. <laughs> oh, they practiced that shit. Well, it was more that they lived Trot Mask replica for eight months. They lived in this little house. This is a larger band. Don would physically assault the band members and harass them. Basically, it was like a, it was kind of like a Burmese political prisoner camp. So it was in Burma. No, I mean, it was just very torturous and unpleasant. Oh, like, yeah. I mean, living with Captain Beefheart would be completely unpleasant. And I guess they were broke and just living off welfare and would eat like a cup of lima beans for dinner. And Holy shit. And then the album came out and they made nothing. <laughs> so for eight months, they prepared this. And so Frank Zappa agreed to record this. The Trotmas Replica recording is more or less a live recording. They just shot through the album like once or twice and all that was recorded. And remember, guys, they lived Trump Mess Replica. They practiced it. They breathed it every day. And that was the final product. It's funny because in the album, there's certain points where you can hear like Zappa talking to them. And they're like, oh, this is going to work. And this is so great. And this and that. Like, there's just, they recorded everything. They hit record. <laughs> and whatever came up, they went, and just put it in the album. Who gives a shit? <laughs> Nobody's going to ever listen to it. Like, there's, do you remember the poetry? Yeah. Ha, you know. Ah, yellow. I listened to Trot Mask Replica. I was waiting for a rental car in San Diego. And they were late in getting my car, so I sat there and listened. It just made the wait all the more worse. <laughs> but you were in San Diego. So I was having a great time, but I was like, holy shit, what is this thing? Why did I pay for this album? Uh. What's wrong with me? <laughs> and you know, for novelty purposes, I've been tempted to find it on vinyl wife well, just kind of go hey i have this album it's kind of goofy maybe play it for friends for a little bit but it's like 40 bucks that's not a reasonable price for trout mask replica. that's not a reasonable price for most vinyl much less trout mask replica most beef art albums are very expensive now because i think everyone wants to just go yeah i'm down with captain beef art and they buy that album and you know they just put it on the record shelf and it is never touched again even when they move, they don't actually take the album. They leave the entire bookshelf and leave Trump Mask just as it was sitting. <laughs> if you go to artist communities and hipster villages, you will find houses for sale. In the description, it says one copy of Trump Mask Replica is found in the house and cannot be moved. <laughs> Technically, the record owns the house. You have, you're leasing it. <laughs> That's one big ass technicality. It is. <laughs> you know, having a a laser shooting alligator is one thing, but to have Trump Mask Replica in the house, that's a lot. I think anyone should listen to this album just because if you want to know what helped inspire The Simpsons, you should listen to this because this is one of Matt Groening's favorite albums. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Uh... To be fair, Matt Groening has one of the most bizarre uh, musical tastes. He uh, curated one of the. Are you familiar with All Tomorrow's Party? The Velvet Underground song? Well, there is the Velvet Underground song, but then there's also a series of festivals they do in Europe. And each time they do the festival, and it's not like once per year, it's like a couple times a year they sort of travels a bit, is that someone is invited to curate the festival. Like, they pick the artist. So one year, I think it was, it was uh, the last one was Jeff, uh, Jeff Meng, Mag, Meng, Mangum? Mangum of Neutral Milk Hotel? Yes, he did one. Um, the Mars Volta did one. Um, I think the people from Portishead did one. And then one of them was Matt Groening. And his All Tomorrow's Party was fucking weird. It had boredoms what? in it. That's all you need. Let, let's just state that much. Boredoms with the 100 dr drum set? I think it was a, a little bit more subdued. It was only like eight drummers, but... Oh, wow. Eight drummers? Man, he really, he really held it back he... that time. <laughs> well, they had to fit them all on the stage, so they had to stop at some point. <laughs> Alex, tell our listeners about Boredoms real quick. So, Boredoms is a musical experience. Sometimes music is a term you use loosely. It's originally a Japanese, more or less a noise rock band, where they would just play obnoxious sounds, scream and yell and hoot and holler, and those would be the albums. They toured with Nirvana in the early 90s. 
So um, I don't even know what to add to that. You add your own little witty comment to that point. And um, then somewhere in the late 90s, they decided to get really hippie-ish. And five or six drummers, they got rid of almost all the instruments. Then it was like, so the band was six to eight drummers and a guy on like a turntable. And then he also had a bunch of guitars melted together to form this giant tower of guitars. And he hit this, <laughs> and he hit the tower with sticks to make weird noises. And then howl every once in a while. And he would howl every once in a while. Um, they did a performance where they had 77 drummers playing at once. Then they did another one with 88 drummers. Then they did another one with 111 drummers. Look it up. Boredoms. You guys will definitely not be bored <laughs> by <laughs> them. <laughs> oh, yeah. So oh. Matt Groening really likes Captain B part. He really likes Trap Mask Replica. Well, that's upsetting. Although that would explain the big book of hell. Yeah. <laughs> Should we talk about any other Cat to Be Part albums? Um, well, I mean, what other ones are there to talk about? Trump Mask Replica is really the one. How about um, Doc at the Radar Station? We seem to have a personal history with that album. We do. That album. <laughs> Was that the one that was listenable, or is it the one that was not listenable at all? Strictly Personal was the um, listenable one, because I think it's his first album. Oh, one okay. of his first albums. So that album is very bluesy, rocky. You can tap your toes to it for at least one song. And then there's Doc at the Radar Station, which is... Um, I mean, what more is there to say? It's a fucking weird album by Captain Beefheart. Imagine Trot Mask Replica only uh, before he created it. Um, imagine, if you will... What if Doc at the Radar Station came out after? Came out after it. I stayed Quite right a few there. years later. Um, imagine, if you will, uh, an old, drug-riddled man who should be on the streets, but for some reason gets paid money so people can stare at him while he yells at a microphone. But that was kind of the great um, thing about the 70s, though. And that's why, for me, the 70s is kind of the golden era of music, in a way. Because art, like, artists that would never in this day and age be given big record contracts were being given big record contracts to play the most obnoxious stuff known to man. And look how that turned out. And once the 80s rolled around, the went, no, we can't do this anymore. We have to really rein in our spending, because this is silly. I thought we were supposed to be making money. This is absurd. <laughs> oh. How come this Captain Beefheart fella isn't exploding yet? Because Rick Rubin didn't produce him. That's why. I don't want, <laughs> sir. It's because he does. He just keeps inventing his own time signatures. Pie over cheese should work. It works in real life. Why should it work in music? Smiley face over a, a crudely drawn pair of tits. This picture of Gerald Ford is marvelous. Play in that time signature now. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, well, Doc at the radio station is kind of like bite-sized Trot Max replica. If you are daunted by the 28 tracks of Trot Max replica, it's it's almost 80 minutes long. <laughs> oh, that's almost as long as Lulu. You remember that album made by Lou Reed featuring Metallica? I haven't listened to it. <laughs> it's so bad. <laughs> Oh, it's so dumb. I oh. listen to bits and pieces. It's uh And that's all you need to hear, because it's 90 minutes of that. An old man singing over poorly singing over Metallica. I would never call what Lou Reed does singing. Talking over it. Talking over poorly done rock music, metal. It's music. like imagine yourself as a teenager. You're sitting in your room trying to listen to Metallica, really just zone out and and, and then get back in the zone because it's metal. Like, yeah, I'm in the zone. But, like, your 65-year-old uncle comes in the room and starts talking to you about, uh, you know, strange tales and other awful comic books that he read when he was your age. Yeah. <laughs> I was your age. Howard the Duck was first published. Oh, Howard the Duck. It was so great. <laughs> Howard the Duck. Howard the Duck. I want you to be my dog prostitute. I hate you. Let's get married. Lulu. Be glad we're not talking about Lulu more in depth. We have to stop at that moment because afterwards it just gets uh, unsuitable for children. Unsuitable for anybody. The Dock at the Radar Station is about half the length of Trot Mask Replica and slightly more tolerable. 
Slightly. Slightly. Is that the one with the best best batch best yet? Best batch yet. Dirty blue jean. Sheriff of Hong Kong. Oh, the sheriff of Hong Kong. Dirty blue jean. Best batch yet. Sheriff of Hong Kong. In my personal favorite, making love to a vampire with a monkey on my knee. <laughs> and if you would just say, he must have just had a big bag of words, and he just pull them out and go, these are the words I can use for the song. That's one theory. My theory, and and bear with me, is that he took his thoughts, reversed every third word, garbled them. I don't even know what that is. It's a verb. It stands for <laughs> writing down your thoughts, throwing them in one of those lottery, those uh, those wheels, those spinning wheels for like lottery balls, and then taking them out, gluing them to your best friend's forehead, and then reading them upside down. That's a very extensive process it's a that's called beef hearting you gotta garble to, to beef heart the thing i have to give captain beef credit for is that he wasn't just weird in his music he was just weird in general there are some excellent clips on the internets of him being interviewed by uh not jay leno who's the other guy david letterman david letterman in the 80s and here was a great thing about David Letterman back in like the 70s and 80s is he would interview anybody that would come by. He'd be like, fuck it, I'll interview you. He still does. Why was Mastodon on his show? As like guests or as, musical performers. As a music performer. Oh no, but Captain Beefheart wasn't a musical performer. He was a guest. Oh, was, like he sat down and talked? Yeah, he like, he had what, Captain Beefheart, he had Frank Zappa a million times, Andy Kaufman. And Andy Kaufman is just a bizarre example of a human being. Yeah, that was a weird interview. Please, please don't laugh. This this isn't a this isn't a, a comedy show. Um. Anyway, so my wife left me, and my house burned down. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about, Andy Kaufman? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so he was on. Um... <laughs> I'm sorry. I have to. Remember last time we gave Rolling Stone a lot of shit over because they did stupid things? Yeah. So, do you remember the cover for Doc at the Radar Station? Yeah. Well, it was number 49 on their top 100 greatest album covers. Isn't that the, the album where they're, like, looking through a, a doorbell? Or uh, the hole in, like, the door, whatever it's called? It's, like, a... I'll, I'll put this picture up on, on our Facebook page. Um... What did Rolling Stone give this album? Number 49 in their top 100 album covers of all time. So this album looks like it was drawn by a... Troll? A very untalented freshman in high school. The, the, it was a Captain B part piece of art. I mean, what, he retired from music in the early 80s and he did art full time. It also looks like a picture like a stock picture and a picture frame that you can get at pier one imports <laughs> so um take that however you want it doesn't sound like you really like this captain beef art that much i don't i don't like that out al- or the the album art definitely doesn't deserve to be in the top 2000 of album covers <laughs> ever like that's like let's i'm gonna pick a random random album for my collection all right here we go i've got Pieces of a Man by Gil Scott Heron. It's just a picture of him with an afro hanging out. Easily in the top 20. <laughs> Here's another one. Sketches of Spain by Miles Davis. That can be in the top top 70, top 50 maybe. Number one, of course, it's got to be The Grand Tour by George Jones with his giant mutton chops. <laughs> I'll put up a picture of that on the Facebook page as well. But yeah, uh, Beefheart was on Letterman a couple times, like, doing interviews, and it's just the weirdest, weirdest thing you could ever imagine. Like, he just came on with, like, a like a bottle and a bag, and everyone just kind of like, oh, what the hell he's drinking on? He's drinking on the set. And then you realize he just brought a bottle of, uh... A seltzer water? Yeah, like a glass bottle of seltzer water. He's like, you don't mind if I drink this on stage, do you? And, oh yeah, it was like a uh, Perrier. Yeah, wasn't it was it? Perrier. <laughs> and Letterman's like, "What the, the hell and, is going on?" You could tell anytime Letterman would have a weird guest, he would always just kind of look at the camera and be like, "I don't know what I'm doing, but who cares?" 
<laughs> I can get away with it. Waka waka waka. <laughs> and then during <laughs> during one of the sections, like I hear you have a new music video. It's like, yeah, it's really good. You want to hear it? Yeah, it's called Ice Cream for Crow. And then it plays typical Captain Beefheart. <laughs> I love my ice cream, ice cream for crawl. It's a general hubbub of noises and clicks and whistles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I fucking love that man. Just for the... Because no one could stop him. He did whatever he wanted. Yep. And then he... uh he got a little too friendly with a family of otters, and may he rest in peace. Yeah, he has, him and Zappa have passed, and maybe they're playing concerts together in the sky. Or in hell, <laughs> where they belong. Because <laughs> they're libertarians. I think hell is just Trap Mask Replica played over and over and over again. <laughs> in conclusion... In terms of just kind of understanding musically in rock history, you need to listen to albums by both these artists, I would say. Yeah, you should definitely dabble in the weird. Dabbling in the weird just expands your palette of music. If you just kind of stick with um, the same formulaic music all the time, you know, I guess if it works for you, it works for you, but there's so much good stuff that doesn't get publicity just because it's a little goofy and weird and there's a lot of stuff that is weird and awful and you need to talk about it. make sure everybody listens to it at least once just kind of like a bad smell where you just smell it and then you have to make somebody else smell it that the smell this factor even if you say this smells terrible hey smell it people are going to smell it <laughs> you can't stop them you can't Sometimes you invite your friends over to watch Troll 2, but before everyone's gathered, you go, I'm going to put on this Throbbing Gristle record, and we're all going to listen to it together. Throbbing Gristle, just so you guys know, is, uh, I term it as nightmare music, (laughs) because it is nightmare music. (laughs) Not music that will give you nightmares. Music from your nightmares. (laughs) The boom. (laughs) The boom. (laughs) Just listen to Throbbing Gristle. The accurate cover of Throbbing Gristle. Let's say you need to recommend two Frank Zappa albums and one Captain Beefheart album. What would you recommend to our listeners? I would recommend the Greatest Hits album, uh, Cheap Thrills. By Frank Zappa, uh, they take they take out eighty percent of the weird, so it's mostly digestible. Um, as well as "Shake Your Booty," which I believe is just pure delight. It is just pure delight. Um, and as far as Captain Beefheart, just listen to one one song. <laughs> it doesn't matter what song; <laughs> just listen to one, and you'll 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 understand. <laughs> Um, I would say, well, since you said shake your booty, I will not, I will not, uh, say the same thing. I am torn a little bit because I want to recommend Hammersmith Odeon. However, it is extremely long, as great of an album as it is, and as great of a showcase as it is of his talent, it is obscenely long, so I will not recommend it. I would say Apostrophe is a great place to start. I agree. Um, you may have heard bits of it, and you didn't know it. You probably have heard Don't Eat the Yellow Snow at some point in your life. Hopefully. If you've ever listened to Dr. Demento, you have. You have, you have heard it. If if you haven't heard of Dr. Demento, I weep for you. <laughs> and then I would say uh, Hot Rats. It is a Actually, it's a jazz album. So both these albums are a little bit lower on the weirdness scale for Zappa. Um, so they're good entry points. Cheek your booty, the lyrics are a little goofy sometimes, but musically it's pretty straightforward. Occasionally Zappa had an album where even musically it's like, what the, this is just very goofy. Uh, but Hot Rats is pretty straightforward, but you get a lot of the, I kind of, uh, you get a lot of what Zappa would do. 
in terms of just musical compositions and very intricate, well put together. Uh, and if both of those really tickle your fancy, I would then maybe move on to um, One Size Fits All or Overnight Sensation. But with Captain Beefheart, I would actually recommend, recommend a full album. And I would recommend Strictly Personal. It is <clears throat> a relatively safe album in Captain Beefheart terms. So if you can survive it, maybe move on to something else. But I think it's worth listening to one Beefheart album all the way through just to get an idea of what madness sounds like. Yes. <laughs> Join us next time when we... I don't know. What do you want to talk about next time? Do you want to talk about some new albums? Do some more reviews or do we want to... I don't know. I think we should do at least one review. One review? Of an album. Yeah. I don't know what review or what album that's going to be. <laughs> um... Uh, with that, do you think we should uh, we should open it up to the, the our listeners to recommend an album that we should listen to? Yeah. If you think we should review something, leave us a comment, all 13 of you. Though I think two of those are us, so I don't know if that counts. Um, but so the other 11 of you, and hopefully that grows, because we are growing at an alarming rate of four people per episode. By the way. Uh, I am alarmed. I'm astounded. Um, but yeah, leave us a comment. If you want us to review something, we will explore it. We will give it a try. Um, otherwise, we'll have to think of something, and that is when dangerous things happen. <laughs> <laughs>